Hello there, lovely people. It's Zeon over here from Nintendo Life, and today we're here to talk to you about my five favorite Switch games. Not not the best games on the Switch, but just my personal five favorite Switch games. But of course, I'm not alone. I have two of my bestest Nintendo buddies here today to chat with me about the games. Say hello, guys. Hello, guys. I can't wait to talk about Sushi Striker. <laughs> So like I said, these are going to be my five favorite Switch games. We've already talked about John's on a previous episode, and we're going to be talking about Alex's in the future. But today, today it's just me. The Switch doesn't always get the cool 3D hack and slash action games like Devil May Cry 5 or Nier Automata, but what it does have is the exclusive title Astral Chain, and it's, in my opinion, it's one of the most unique experiences on the Switch. It's such a unique world. It kind of has like a cyberpunk feel to it, I guess, like a futuristic Japanese look. But there's so many different things that I love about Astral Chain. The soundtrack hits it right on the head for me. It has that like metal sort of genty feel. If anyone out there knows ex exactly what I'm saying with that, the, the combat is super over the top. And it, at first I felt really overwhelmed with it because you you control your uh, your main character and then you also control what they call a legion and you get to kind of throw them all around on the map and you know this three it's it's a 3d hack and slash um and like i said it, it feels like a lot at first but once you actually start to get a grasp on the fact that you're controlling two characters at once it gives you so many different options to take on the enemies and the art direction is absolutely right up my alley i love the just like this neon fueled world there's just a lot to love about this game have have either of you played much of it oh i've not played enough of it i've played um i've probably played about 15 hours of it and and it, it just, unfortunately, it just kind of got little, you know, every so often, little by little, got pushed further into the backlog. I keep meaning to go back to it because I absolutely will, because it's, I think it's one of the most original and effortlessly cool games on the Switch. Like, it, it's just cool. Everything about it, you know, the style, the, you know, sort of the, the graphics, which really do not translate well onto YouTube due to compression and stuff like that. <laughs> you really have to see it in person to properly appreciate it. And the combat is so different and yet so rewarding. It's, it's just wonderful. I absolutely adore this. It feels like a culmination of a bunch of different Platinum games. Like, it's got, um, like in Wonderful 101, you kind of draw to make uh, certain al alignments. And that's kind of in here too. Like you can you can use the chain itself to draw circles around opponents to make little moves go on and it has like a lot of the combat elements are kind of from bayonetta and it feels like a lot of those just core components are coming together in a different context um and i love zion you said that it's quite heavy um metal heavy too but then you've got pieces like the neuron hq which are just the that's just like the grooviest track of all time <laughs> I, I love that track i can't get enough of it just the yeah. <laughs> We get a copyright claim that sounds too close to the actual movie. <laughs> <laughs> So this next one for me was a game that I sort of glanced over originally in the beginning and I eventually played it a little bit on PC and I moved over onto Switch eventually and I absolutely fell in love with it. Undertale. Undertale is such a strange game. It's it's absolutely full of life. It has an amazing soundtrack. It has so many things going for it. And the, the thing that originally drew me away from it was the art style. And in the end, it ended up being one of the things that I enjoy about the game most. Even though the uh, the art is a little more minimalistic in, in some ways, because of the story and the way that you interact with the characters, you, you really sort of feel for them and um and you yourself have such a huge part to play in the story i think as well where the protagonist is basically voiceless you sort of feel like you are that person and all of the decisions that you make in the game really affect how the story plays out and it's not the kind of game that no playthrough is going to be the same but but the the way that you do things really has an effect on the overall the overall ending of the game and, and, ma and it makes you feel for the decisions that you make still have, have either of you guys touched Undertale? I know it's such a, like, some people either love it or they, they won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. <laughs> well, you've basically already just summed up everything about it <laughs> in, that, in that stint. Very, very, very concise and effective. I've not actually played this game 
properly myself, which I am not happy about. I would really like to give it a go, but it's just it's just one of those one of those blind spots I've got. But um, I'm a big fan of Sans Undertale, the main character. <laughs> um, he's, it's, just a, it's a great game. I know it's a great game because every, you know it's it's got a lot of heart in it and a lot of um, real uniqueness about it. I put this off for the longest time. Um, I think because of the community, like some of them are delightful, but there are certain elements was like, eh, I don't think I want to play this game. And eventually I did. And it's weird for a game that's so hyped up to live up to expectations, but it kind of did. I had, I had such a good time with this. And I, I didn't think that could possibly be the case with with how rampant um, the praise is for this game. But still, I, I had such a good experience. And it's best going in not knowing anything at all. Like, if you've gone in reading strategy guides, I think you're going to have a lesser time. But just go in blind, and this is just such a delightful game. Very hard to go in blind these days. You guys are right, though. If, you know, Al Alex, if you ever find time to it, don't read into anything else. Just play the game. You can talk to us while you're playing. But, but yeah, just, just do it by yourself unless you get stuck, I guess. <laughs> yes, Dad. Now this next one definitely isn't the best Zelda out there. I recently replayed it basically twice and, and I, I'm fully aware of that. But for me, it's, it's a childhood favorite and it's still one that moves with me to this very day. The Legend of Zelda Link's Awakening. It, in my opinion, is almost a near perfect recreation of the original source material. At first, you know, like some people might be put off by the graphics just because it, you know, it gives off some of those feelings that someone might have felt when Wind Waker came out. You know, Wind Waker was announced and lots of people were expecting this more hardcore Zelda after something like Majora's Mask and Ocarina of Time and and now we we just got Link's Awakening after Breath of the Wild and it's you know L Link can jump still in this game surprisingly um, but there's a lot of things that are, are so much different than Breath of the Wild. This game was criticized when it came out for being such a direct port as well from the original but I played the original right before uh, reviewing this and I remember it just felt so inconvenient. Screens are basically in quadrants. Every single time you move up a screen, you've got to like, it has to scroll with you. And when you're going around the world like that, that can be tedious because it resets all the enemies. And also you've got to pause the game so much because you can only hold two items and that includes your sword and shield. So there's points in the game we've got to pause it, get a bracelet on to pick up a rock. If you don't have the bracelet on, some dialogue box comes up. So the original game is just very inconvenient today, and this alleviates pretty much every inconvenience that game had. I have to agree. It's it again, just like Easy On. This is a game from my childhood, and I love it. I love it to death. It was the first big Zelda game I ever had, and even then, it's probably one of the smaller ones. Um, but I still absolutely adore it, and I think it's a very faithful recreation. But John is absolutely right. There's a lot of um, inconvenience and a lot of aged stuff about it that has been completely you know sort of done over in this remake but you wouldn't necessarily know it because you, you always have a you know a rose-tinted view of the pre of the original and i think that's very common you never really remember what an original game was like when you're playing a remake until you go back and play the original after playing the remake and I'm one of the people where I actually really love the art style. I think it's gorgeous. I love the fact that it runs so well. Bit of, sometimes there's some, you know, frame rate issues, certainly between screens occasionally, but I can forgive it. It's not a game that absolutely requires tip-top performance. And most of the time, it is just flat out stunning. And Dudo's, the soundtrack. <laughs> there's so many brilliant tracks in here. Oh! Tal Tal Heights. Oh. I've seen The Legend of Zelda Symphony twice, and both times they've played Ballad of the Windfish, and I shed a tear. I I swear. <laughs> ba 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 ba. Alex, I'm gonna start crying ba. right now. You you can cry to off key, can you? Ba ba ba. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the original ukulele didn't really pan out how everyone was expecting, but Ukulele in the Impossible Layer, on the other hand, is such a gem of a game. You have to have played some of the original Donkey Kong Countries or even Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. The Impossible Layer channels that exact same energy. 
but they actually managed to get back some of the original sound composers for the game, like David Wise and then Grant Kirkhope from Banjo-Kazooie and GoldenEye. And then for the the world traversal, you actually have this over-the-top segment that kind of channels some Legend of Zelda energy, and you actually get to explore and uh, solve puzzles and go to different levels, and it's kind of a nice break from the, the Donkey Kong Country platforming, which is extremely tough at times. It's, it's not a nail-biter. It, it has a solid level of difficulty until you get to the impossible layer. I had a great time playing the game until I got there. Now, I, I don't... Oh, yeah, you, you both have probably played Impossible Layer by now, haven't you? Oh, God, yeah. I think it's just... It is just a beautifully, wonderful, modern homage to those, you know, sort of Donkey Kong Country-style games, but at the same time giving it its own spin. And indeed, yep, yeah, you say the Impossible Layer. It's kind of like... It's kind of like going to going right to the final boss in a certain game that may be featured in a future episode of, feature of, of this tweet. Um, where you um, you can just go right to the end, like right to the end. But mate, you are gonna you are gonna die. And but I love the fact that it gives you that option, and you're just like, oh well, I'll I'll give it a go. I'll see how far I can get, and it absolutely knocks you for six. It is not easy. It's not not even slightly easy. It is painfully difficult. And in terms of like sequel progression, this feels like rare coming back to Donkey Kong Country. I'm gonna mention the forbidden game, DKC3, <gasps> right? In that game, you can traverse the map yourself. You can get in vehicles and just wander around it like like freely. But when, when Retro Studios took care of Donkey Kong, they kind of reverted back to just a standard set level select screen with DK and Diddy. But this feels like they're trying to expand upon what they made in DKC3. And I love that they returned to that. And also, I'm, I'm no froob. I know that Tropical Freeze released six years ago. And it's great that another game is kind of filling its shoes while we haven't had a proper Donkey Kong game in almost half a decade now. So it's it's just it feels such a great gap um, in terms of that genre, and it really does feel like Rare has returned back to their roots with this one. And while the original ukulele didn't quite pan out how I wanted it to, this was just such a brilliant surprise. No one really saw it coming, and it, it delivered on all fronts. And that's kind of the best part about the way that this game was released as well, is that this, you know, the original ukulele was a Kickstarter project. It had all these sets of goals and things that they were trying to achieve with the game, but the Impossible Layer really seems like it was the game that they wanted to make, because they didn't have any constraints or, you know, all these extra goals that they had to try to reach. They just, they, they, set, they set their own personal goals for the game, and they made it happen, and it's... I think it's one of the best platformers on the Switch. I also think it has some of the best cheats and everything. Those tonics you can get, you can just have so much fun with it. Oh my gosh, you're right! Just have random, horrible effects to make the game almost unplayable. But you can do it, and I, 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 it just reminds me of stuff like Goldeneye. I love old-fashioned old cheat codes like that. More, more of that, please, everyone in the world. And my last favorite game on the Switch could not have come at a better time. I, and I feel like basically everybody on, on the face of the earth can agree with this. Animal Crossing New Horizons. It's a game all about hanging out with people, decorating your house, getting outside, and just exploring the world and having fun. And in a time where not a ton of us could do that the way that we used to, Animal Crossing sort of was, it was like like a nice, not, not even a band-aid, but it was like just a, an, a new option, a new way to to go and hang out with our friends, celebrate birthdays. It's a, you know, it's, it's a cute little simulator, but it has so much heart and so much depth. Animal Crossing fans have been waiting forever for, and gosh, I, I don't know, I could just gush about this game. There, there's so much, so much to talk about it. I, I think for me, and it's it's a bit of a weird thing to celebrate, but one of my favorite things is arguably the inconvenience. The fact that you have to wait, uh, you know, in real time to go to the next day. It just adds a real sense of, I don't know, groundedness to the game and just really makes you appreciate things all the more because you really have to work for them. You will eventually reach the point where bells are no object, but in order to get that point to that point, you really have to work or just do the turn the stalk market. But it, regardless, it's just absolutely fantastic. And when this game came out, I was um, I was actually having my kitchen redone, which was frankly it just basically took over our lives because the kitchen is like a really central part of our house and Animal Crossing was genuinely a really excellent escape for me and I got it early because I was reviewing it <laughs> um 
So yeah, I, it, it, always going to have an incredibly special place in my heart, this game. And I would have included it on my list if we didn't say that there wasn't going to be any crossover for the sake of everything. This series has always been about escapism, and I think the prospect of going to a deserted island just speaks to that way more than it ever has. Like, going to another village, sure, but just leaving, like, the entire country, going to your own little island, that just sells the idea far better than it ever has before. And, um, not only that, but you can represent yourself far better than any game in the series. Uh, New Leaf, in an update, uh, allowed you to change your skin colour, but before that game, um, this series never allowed you to do that. So for the very, well, pretty much the very first time in the base game, you can change your skin colour, you can change your hair, you can change your eyes, you can change pretty much anything you want and be who you want to be in your own little island. And that's just so cute and adorable. Yeah, but more importantly, you can actually change your character, your entire appearance down to everything. Hair, you know, the works. Whenever you like, you're not locked in when you first create your character. And I think that's just so great because, you know, what if what if you do, you know, dye your hair or you get a significant haircut, you know? It, it's just so important that that sort of stuff is there, and it's just wonderful. It's just, it's really open and hugely appealing. I definitely agree. And there's some complaints about the, the way that the game kind of sort of drip feeds you content as well. You know, we're getting, you know, people can't just time travel because in the game you can actually, well, you can change the, the clock on your Switch and you can adjust the time. So if you if you don't want to be like what Alex was, was saying and uh, you want to, you know, skip days and things like that, you can, but um, I don't. If you want to go see Jingle on Toy Day before the update came out, you couldn't just do that. And I think it's kind of a nice way to keep fans excited and invested. And if Nintendo continues this process of releasing content slowly, you know, over the course of time, I think this is a game that some of us could be playing for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and a New Leaf update gave that game Puzzle League. So if Puzzle League comes to New Horizons, then I'm never playing another game. John has to try and force Puzzle League into every single video possible. I'm just surprised he didn't call it Panel de Pond, frankly. It could happen, John. That update didn't come until like five years, six years later? It was Welcome Amiibo when it came, yeah. It was uh, quite a while after. Yeah, yeah. So who knows? Maybe, maybe in, in that amount of time, we'll have Puzzle League in New Horizons, and you can be the the happiest boy. Oh, you can be the happiest boy. <laughs> <laughs> and there we have it, my favorite five games on the Nintendo Switch. Now, of course, Alex and John both have their own separate favorite games on the Switch, right? You, your your favorites aren't all mine, right? No, no, I've got I've got my own favorites as well. Shut up. Oh, I guess that means we're gonna have to give Alex his own video to talk, and and John has already had his moment. So if you want to go check out those videos, we'll we'll probably have both of them up on screen if we remember to do it, or if I can even figure out technology. <laughs> and uh, you're, you're very honest. You're very <laughs> honest. <laughs> and in the meantime, if you uh, enjoy this video and you want to see more content like this, then uh, why don't you go ahead and um, tell that subscribe button it's your favorite by giving it a good old click and then ring that notification bell to be notified whenever we release new videos. Ding ding. And while you're at it, feel free to let us know your favorite Switch games in the comments down below and then copy paste that and go post it on Alex's video and John's video so that way we all have the same <laughs> amount of love. <laughs> Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Zian from Nintendo Life. Stay safe out there and we will see you next time. Bye bye. Bye. Oh.